All right. I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this inaugural event and what I hope will be a long-standing project on series of lectures, symposia, who knows? The prehistory of the book. It's a collaboration between the Center for the Pre-Modern World and Doheny Library Special Collections Department. I'm Jay Rubenstein, and as director of the Center for Pre-Modern World, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the work of my colleagues, Danielle Miram and Melissa Miller, who have collaborated closely with me throughout this process. The goals of our project are twofold. First, we want to study the cultures of written communication that existed before the published book became both the norm and the highest expression of literate transmission. Uh, we do not ask where the book came from or highlight the limitations of the written word in a pre-publication world. Rather, we wish to examine strategies, technologies, and products of written communication as practiced in the pre-modern world, the world widely uh, the word pre-modern world widely conceived and the topic as well, be it epigraphy, manuscripts, political broadsides, incunabula, you name it, whatever you can imagine. The emergence of the, publish, uh, the publishing industry marks the chronological endpoint of our project, but its explanation is not our teleological aim. The second goal of our work is to highlight the holdings of the collections here at USC. When I first considered applying to direct this newly founded center, um, I was excited at the possibility of having access to the resources, the manuscript resources at the Huntington and at the Getty. As a medieval historian, to my thinking, manuscripts are the lifeblood of my profession. What I was not expecting was the presence on campus here at USC of several medieval manuscripts, which can serve as cultural, historical, and artistic resources for both research and teaching, and indeed they already are. From the moment I arrived on campus, my friend and colleague Sabina Zono, has, this year who's a fellow at the Huntington Library, has drawn my attention to these resources, particularly USC's two books of ours, which brings me to today's speaker. Professor Gregory Clark from the University of the South, um, a renowned liberal arts college in my former home state of Tennessee, and the site of one of the most rewarding and indeed legendary medieval studies conferences in the field. Um, and formerly assistant curator of the medieval and uh, Renaissance manuscripts collection at the Pierpont Morgan Library in New York, one of the great treasures of medieval manuscript culture in America and indeed the world. Professor Clark is a renowned expert on the subject of illuminated manuscripts, in particular books of ours from Northern Europe. A precise description of the two manuscripts we have here at Doheny and that are on that back shelf back there, which we'll be looking at later on today. His publications are numerous and include the Hours of Isabella La Catolica, Made in Flanders, The Master of the Gint Colburn Privileges, The Spitzmaster, a Parisian Book of Hours, and Art in a Time of War, The Master of Morgan 453 and Manuscript Illumination in Paris during the Occupation. He has maintained this prodigious scholarly output while carrying out wide ranging teaching duties at Swanee ancient medieval renaissance, and, I, and as I learned today, American animation. He is finally a native of Los Angeles. We are happy to welcome him for a visit home and could not be more delighted to have him inaugurate our program in the prehistory of the book. Please welcome Professor Gregory Clark. Uh, yeah. I need one minute. <laughs> Um, well, thank you all for coming. Let me begin by thanking Jay Rubenstein uh, for inviting me and for all the help I've gotten already from Daniel Miram, Melissa Miller, and in terms of just uh, nuts and bolts, Isabel Rose Carr. And so let me just start right in. In 2014, the Doheny Memorial Library was able to acquire two 15th century Southern Netherlandish manuscript books of ours for teaching and research purposes. The earlier, on the left, was purchased from John Wendell, antiquarian booksellers of San Francisco. The later, on the right, was acquired from Linga and Son of Copenhagen. In my presentation today, I would like first to speak about the Book of Hours as a text, 
and then to consider each of the Doheny manuscripts individually as works of late medieval art and craft. The texts for the liturgy or public worship of the Christian church fall into two groups. The first group comprises texts for the celebration of the mass or Eucharist, the central sacrament of the church. The second group of texts is those for the divine office. That is the daily round of public devotional prayer. The principal text for the mass is the missal. The principal text for the divine office is the breviary. And so on the left, of course, a celebration of the Eucharist, and on the right, the performance of the one of those divine office texts, the office of the dead. Now, while the mass is fundamentally a single sacrificial rite instituted by Christ at the Last Supper, the divine office has no necessary ritual and no fixed design. The origins of the texts of the divine office can be traced back to the apostolic period and to services in the Jewish synagogue. Those texts had evolved by the Middle Ages into a cycle of eight separate devotions or hours for each day. I project here the names of the hours and their approximate times. Please note that the times of the first two and last two hours can vary considerably according to the time of year. Books of hours are often classified with books of the divine office. Since the book of hours distinguishing text, the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary is usually included in the breviary and is modeled after the breviary's eight hours for each day. The book of hours differs from the normal offices in several important ways, however. First, the book of hours was used for private devotions, not the public liturgy recorded in breviaries. The book of hours, therefore, is not, strictly speaking, a liturgical text at all, but rather a quasi-liturgical text. Second, unlike the breviary, which was read primarily by those in religious orders, the Book of Hours was intended first and foremost for the laity. A window, both literally and figuratively, into the character and purpose of the Book of Hours in late medieval art and life is presented by this celebrated miniature. In the foreground, Mary, Duchess of Burgundy, reads her Book of Hours. In the background, seen through an open window, Mary, Mary of Burgundy seems to be rewarded for her pious reading by either being admitted in her mind's eye into the Virgin Mary's celestial throne room or by being granted a vision of the Virgin and Child in the choir of an earthly church in the Brabantine Gothic style, the style practiced in her northern dominions in her own lifetime. Because the worldly lives of most of the laity allowed insufficient time to recite the copious, copious texts recorded in the breviary, the texts in books of hours were made short enough to allow lay people to read some or most of them every day. Four of the standard texts in a book of hours were extracted from the breviary. These I illustrate here with openings from the two Doheny hours. These are the calendar, which record the feasts or celebrations of the Christian liturgical year. The hours of the Virgin itself. The seven penitential psalms of King David of Israel, followed directly by a litany, that is, a sequence of petitions and prayers to the deity, to the Virgin, and to the saints. And the office of the dead. The text recited in the Middle Ages over the body of the deceased, the night and morning before the funeral mass itself. To these four texts, the Book of Hours adds a series of set passages from the four Gospels of the New Testament, known as Gospel readings, and illustrated in the two Doheny Books of Hours, so no image. The relatively brief Hours of the Cross and Hours of the Holy Spirit, absent 
from the earlier dominia, but present in the later one, shown here. Two Latin prayers to the Virgin, known from their opening words as the obsecro te, that is, I beseech you, and the O in temerata, that is, O immaculate Virgin, absent from the two Dauphine books of ours. And lastly, suffrages, or extended petitions for the saints, also absent from both Dauphine books of ours. Ancillary texts are often found in many books of ours, but the aforementioned 10 te texts are foundational and most often present. The Hours of the Virgin first appeared in breviaries in the 11th century, thus at the beginning of the High Middle Ages. In the 12th and 13th centuries, the Hours of the Virgin were often joined with the Psalter, that is, the Book of Psalms, divided into seven discrete units for the seven days of the week, and each unit divided again into psalms for each of the eight liturgical hours of the day. The resulting text was called a Psalter Hours. I show here two openings from the Psalter Hours of Isabel of France, daughter of King Louis VIII of France, and sister of the celebrated Saint King Louis IX of France. By the end of the 13th century, however, the Hours of the Virgin was being detached from the Psalter to become a devotional book in its own right. On the screen is the early 14th century book of Hours of Jean de Navarre, daughter of King Louis X of France. To judge from the many thousands of surviving examples, both decorated and undecorated, the popularity of the Book of Hours accelerated in the 14th century, exploded in the 15th century, and began to taper off only towards the middle of the 16th century. All Books of Hours were manuscripts, that is, books written by hand, up until the advent of movable type printing in the third quarter of the 15th century at which point manuscript books of ours were joined by scores of printed editions like this one. Given all of this, Roger Wick, curator of manuscripts at the Morgan Library in New York, has rightly called the book of ours the bestseller of the Middle Ages. Although bestseller of the late Middle Ages might be closer to the mark. I should add that the Book of Hours did not disappear altogether after the 16th century. My own bilingual working copy was printed in 1915. The preferred support for manuscript Books of Hours was vellum, that is stretched animal skin. Paper joined vellum as a support with the rise of printed Books of Hours. With respect to decoration, Manuscript books of ours run the gamut from a handful of colored initials at the incapits or openings of key texts to tens of scores, even hundreds of decorated initials and miniatures, that is, pictorial images, with both the miniatures and the text blocks often surrounded by sumptuously decorated orders. All such decoration is called illumination from the Latin verb illuminare, to give light. France was the epicenter of production for manuscript books of ours, with the Southern Netherlands, roughly modern day Belgium, following close behind. The two Doheny books of ours were both made in the Southern Netherlands and relatively close together in time, in the second third of the 15th century. Let's turn to them now. For the sake of brevity, brevity, I will call the later manuscript in 1450 hours after its Doheny OCLC number. Its, te its, te its text comprise, in order, the calendar, the hours of the cross, the hours of the Holy Spirit, an ancillary text called the Mass of the Virgin, shown here, the gospel sequences, the hours of the Virgin, the seven penitential psalms and litany, finally, the office of the dead. All of the texts in the 1450 hours are in Latin. All eight texts, save the calendar 
and gospel sequences in the 1450 hours begin on rectos, that is on the right-hand sides of their respective openings. As we can see here, the six texts that begin on rectos are faced with inserted single leaves with full page miniatures enclosed by stylized floral decoration on their versos and matching floral decoration enclosing the text blocks on the facing seven text rectos. Although only the first hour of the Virgin at Matins is faced with a full page miniature, the incapits for the remaining seven hours were all begin on rectos as well, shown here. This makes clear that all eight hours of the Virgin were carefully copied out to accommodate facing miniatures on inserted leaves. Whether such miniatures were never provided for the 1450 hours or provided but later removed is unclear. While most of the texts in the typical Book of Hours are not peculiar to one center or region, the texts of the Hours of the Virgin and Office of the Dead and the saints chosen for inclusion in calendars and litanies often are peculiar to one center or region. We use the term localization to describe the identification of readings in the Hours of the Virgin or Office of the Dead and of strictly local saints and feasts in calendars that enable us to determine where liturgical and quasi-liturgical texts were written to be used. Unfortunately, the hours of the Virgin in the 1450 hours conform to the universal use of Rome, that is, the use of the clergy in the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran, the Episcopal seat of the Bishop of Rome. As a consequence, the use of Rome is of no help for pinpointing where the 1450 hours or any other manuscript for the use of Rome was actually written to be used, which is why I describe the Rome use as the useless use, it does nothing for you. Now the Office of the Dead is also of no help in this respect, as it contains only three of the usual nine lessons that together with petitions for each lesson known as versicles and responses, are needed to determine where an individual office of the dead was written to be used. But the calendar and litany of the 1450 hours do contain strictly local, local saints and feasts. To orient my listeners, I here project a diocesan map of the Southern Netherlands before the redrawing of the diocesan lines throughout Europe in 1559. So let me use the mouse. This here, this dotted line is the modern border between France south, Belgium to the north. This dotted line describes the uh, border between modern day Belgium and the modern day Netherlands. Two dotted, I've indicated the lines and the centers that will concern us today are all in Belgium. They are Tournay, right here, Ghent, right there, and finally Bruges. All of them, as you can see, falling inside, more or less, the Diocese of Tournay. Now, in the 1450 hours, feasts of high grading are written in red, feasts of low grading are written in black. The two key red letter feasts are Amalberga on the 10th of July here and Bavo on the 1st of October. Now, Bavo is a red letter saint in Bruges and the Dutch city of Utrecht as well as Ghent. Amalberga is red letter only in Ghent. That the manuscript was in Ghent in the late 15th or early 16th century is confirmed by the inscription on the last paper flyleaf, which was added when the book was rebound. It identifies the owner as one Grieken Bex, who lived in the Grote Geenhof, or Great Beginage, of Ghent. A Beginage is an architectural complex created to house Beguines, that is, lay religious women who lived in community without taking vows or retiring from the world. The Beguinage in Ghent in question is the old St. Elizabeth Beguinage, 
begun in 1234 under the patronage of Countess Johanna of Constantinople, daughter of Count Baldwin IX of Flanders, the county that included Ghent in the Middle Ages. But while the 1450 hours appears to have been written producing Ghent, and surely was there by the late 15th or early 16th century, it may not have been made in Ghent. The inclusion of Babel among the martyrs in the litany, rather than among the confessors who belongs, suggests that the texts of the 1450s, 50 hours were not written in Ghent, as it's very hard to imagine any scribe based in Ghent making this mistake. Also surprising is the fact that Amalberga of Ghent is not among the virgins in the litany. That the 1450 hours may have been confected elsewhere than in Ghent is supported by the style of its miniatures and borders. These are in the style of the mild May master, one of the many, and I mean many, illuminators working in Bruges in the third quarter of the 15th century in styles that derived from the gold scrolls style, the dominant style in Bruges in the second quarter of the 15th century. I compare here two miniatures in the 1450 hours with the same subjects in a book of hours in the mild May master style sold in London at Christie's in 2008. Here, the Virgin and Child with one or more angels, and here, the Annunciation. The borders in the 1450 hours present a mixture of broad, brightly colored, stylized acanthus leaves, together with rinseau, that is, fine vines in black pen and ink studded with ivy leaves and small leaves and blossoms, many of them in burnished gold. These borders are also typical of Bruges production in the third quarter of the 15th century, as the two images on the screen illustrate. The fine red rules around the border foliage in the 1450 hours point to a date in the third quarter of the 15th century as well. Given all of this, a date between about 1460 and 70, and an origin in Bruges rather than in Ghent for the 1450 hours seems most likely to me. We are on much firmer ground origin-wise with the second Goheni hours, which I shall call after its OCLC number, the 1460 hours. Here I show its two full-page miniatures. Its texts comprise a calendar, hours of the Virgin, followed by alternate, alternative readings for those hours, from the first Sunday in Advent up until the purification of the Virgin on the 2nd of February, as well as antiphons to be read at certain times of the year. All that is followed by the penitential psalms and litany, and lastly, the office of the dead. The calendar and many rubrics, that is, text headers written entirely in red, blue, or gold, rather than in black, are in French. All other texts are in Latin. Now the hours of the Virgin and Office of the Dead in the 1460 hours are for the universal and useless use of Rome. And the litanies contain no strictly local saints, but the calendar, by contrast, is clearly written for use in the Diocese of Tournai. As in the 1450 hours, feasts of high grading are written in red, and feasts of low grading in black. In the 1460 hours, the feasts include Eleutherius on 20 February in red, the dedication of the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Tournai, also in red, on 9 May, the very unusual translation of the relics or body parts of Eleutherius to Tournai Cathedral on 25th August, and finally, Dieton in red on the 1st of October. There are also two black letter feasts for Condor. Here, this one, Vincent Madelgaris on the 14th of July, and Gislames on 9 October. The presence in the 1460 hours of those two Cambrai saints should not surprise us. The city of Tournai straddled the diocese of Tournai to the west, 
Cambrai to the east before the redrawing of the diocesan lines in 1559. The Episcopal seat for the Diocese of Tournai was located in the larger western part. The smaller eastern part of the city of Tournai fell into the Diocese of Cambrai. That the 1460 hours was indeed made in Tournai is confirmed by its original panel stamp binding. As the signatures on the back cover reveal, the binder was Jacques Pontier, who is documented in Tournai between 1414 and 1448. All eight hours of the Virgin, the penitential psalms, and the office of the dead in the 1460 hours are illustrated with two full page and eight half page miniatures, thus 10 miniatures all together. A Provençal or Italian miniature portrait of a bis bishop saint is also pasted in at the front book. The 10 full and half page miniatures in the 1460 hours are in a style that I have not encountered exactly in any other 15th century Southern Netherlandish manuscript. That the book's 15th century painter was based in Tournai, however, is suggested by the stylistic resemblances between the 1460 hours coronation of the Virgin and the same subject in a book of hours offered in London by Sotheby's in 1980. Although the Hours of the Virgin and the Sotheby's manuscript are for Rome, use Pieton of Tournai appears in red on the 1st of October in the calendar, just as he does in the 1460 Hours. Pieton also appears in the litanies of the Sotheby's manuscript. Now, as the Sotheby's Book of Hours also contains a suffrage to Bernardinus of Siena, canonized in 1450, the Sotheby's manuscript must have been made in, made in or after that year. To judge from the absence of an enclosing rule around the floral border surrounding the coronation of the Virgin, the Sotheby's Book of Hours was probably made before about 1460, by which time such enclosing rules had become the norm in Southern Netherlandish manuscripts. Save the two pages moved to the far right here, that is the fifth rightmost column, red enclosing, enclosing rules are absent from the upper margins of the miniature pages of the 1460 hours as well. Now as originally conceived, the borders on the pages with miniatures and large colored initials were filled in with a mixture of broad, brightly colored stylized acanthus leaves and very fine rinseau. The acanthus leaves dominate on the two pages with large miniatures, here at the far upper left and the far lower right, while the rinseau dominate on the pages with half page miniatures and large colored initials. Today, the borders on the pages with miniatures and large colored initials throughout the 1460 hours are enclosed on three or four sides by baguettes, that is, broad burnished gold or colored bands with decorative patterning. That these were added after the acanthus and rinseau had been executed, executed is made clear by the way that those baguettes clip the rinseau on the page on the right, and I have put in a glow up details to show this on the right, and on many others in the 1460 hours. The overextension of the rules in pen and black ink on the page on the left and elsewhere in the manuscript also suggest haste, inattentiveness, a lack of expertise, or maybe a combination of these. Given the absence of Bernardinus of Siena, canonized in 1450, from both the calendar and the litanies of the 1460 hours, and the absence of rules in closing, closing the original borders in that manuscript, a date of around 1450 for the 1460 hours seems reasonable. An origin in Tournai for the book seems to me to be beyond reasonable doubt. What I've presented to you this afternoon with respect to the 1450 and 1460 Doheny books of ours leaves many questions unanswered 
and many other avenues of research I've explored. Here, let me cite just three such avenues. First, might an exhaustive search for detached leaves in the mild May Master style make it possible to establish that all eight hours of the Virgin there were provided with full page miniatures that were later removed? I should warn any eager souls among you that any such effort will be daunting. Literally scores, if not hundreds, of manuscripts in and close to the mild May Master style have survived to this day. Second, while the Chot Echenhof no longer stands in Ghent, its records may well survive in the city's archives. Might a search of those records make it possible to identify the Kriken Bex who owned the 1450 hours? Third and finally, when were the baguettes in the 1460 hours added? Was it very soon after the book's making, perhaps even at the original owner's request before the manuscript was delivered? Was it done later in the 15th century? Much later than that. A scientific examination of 1460 hours in its entirety would surely help answer these and other questions. One of the rewards of studying Western medieval manuscripts is that no two are ever exactly alike. Each one is a handcrafted unicum that deserves to be considered and valued on its own terms, as well as within the larger contexts of the historical, cultural, and artistic currents that shape its creation. At the very least, I hope that this presentation has conveyed to you the great joy that studying these objects has brought to me over the last 40 years. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to ask two more general questions than the uh, main manuscripts. One of them, how did they contain hours, the actual hours? I mean, what did they do to 2.30 a.m. in a monastery in 1300? How did they know? How did they? Okay. The, um, I'll, let me answer that based on my experience looking at a manuscript, at the Benedictine manuscript, uh, a monastery a Thongombo in uh, near Poitiers. Bells ring, everything stops. Whatever you're doing, you go to the uh, chapel, which is Romanesque, by the way, quite nice. And the, the hour is then basically recited. And even if you're a secular visitor, as I was, you hear the bells, you know, you trot out. Even if it is, and of course, I went in June, so the day was long. And so 2.33, you are, you are already starting to get light again because, you know, it's it's close to the summer solstice. So that's how you know. Bells, for clerics, bells were rung. This ringing the hours, as it's called. Uh, and my other question is not related to the hours uh, and how they're uh, practiced. But uh, in 1450, the, the movable type, you know, we think of it as a disruptive technology, but obviously it was a manuscript continue being produced. So I wonder how long did the two happen to printing? As I said, the production of, of manuscripts of ours tends to peter off towards the middle of the 16th century. It had already begun to fundamentally printed books of ours moved up print, uh, and manuscript books of ours moved down. As I think is obvious from these images, these of course also were luxury objects. Having a manuscript one, even in the era of printing, was prestigious. It's a handcrafted object, and it's, you know, the printed book of ours, especially on paper, was by contrast very affordable. And if you wanted a midway point, you could buy a book of ours printed on vellum. And these, of course, are absolutely gorgeous, especially since the way that the ink takes to the hair and flesh side of the vellum differently. You also have the qual a wonderful quality of the way the inks tend to shimmer on one side and to be more matte on the other side. So I think basically, Printed, printing printed books of ours uh, ascended, manuscript books of ours, especially modest ones, declined. But luxury ones, I, they, they continue to be produced, although maybe not in huge numbers, into about really, I, frankly, to the mid 16th century. 
And that's a, that's a rough approximation based on survival. Yes. It's relatively, um, in monasteries, the, having your name in the explicit is a commonplace. You know, this manuscript was finished on St. Margaret's Day, it was like, you know, at this time by, by so-and-so. These are commercial books and, oh yes, these are unquestionably commercial books. Um, the way that, for example, the earlier, uh, the later hours is a product of assemblage where you have, you know, a production where you, you make them and you can, you can have the book written in one place and then say, well, let's get leaves from another city. I, I like this style. And all they have to then do is match up the borders and you're not going to know if the, the appearance will be um, seamless. No, signing um, uh, books of hours was extremely rare. Um, it does happen, but it, it's very, very rare, which is, and also of course artists didn't sign their work, which of course means you're always dealing with names of, often, most often with names of convenience. Now, these are both commercial um, products. Um, Jeffrey Hamburger has published a lot about man manuscripts made in nunneries, and they have a much more homespun character. Loads of charm, but they are not sumptuous objects. I couldn't find any spider. No, it would be, it'd be very rare. Yes? I have a question. Where did you acquire them, especially for Kentucky ones? They came here in 2014. And what was the thing Well, I did mention the dealers they bought them from. Uh, Can you trace No, because, well, I haven't tried. I just, there is the description online, of course, that is there. Um, and I don't know how, um, I don't know how, of course, beyond that, I know more about this one, a lot more of this one. This one was on the trade, was in the market in the 1990s. It's that one, um, I know where it, it was offered by Sandra Hyman of Les Amis New York in a catalog number six. And, it, and that I know, that, that I found uh, ferreting around my home office. The other, I have not tried to go further back. Um, and I, and there's, I don't believe there's, unless something was provided by the dealer, in which case I think it would be assumed, included, excuse me, uh, in the description online. Well, for instance, if Sandra Hyman had issues Well, what she knew she put into catalog number six, you know, or what she's willing to let on, she put into catalog <laughs> number six, and I'll leave it at that. Yes. Well, oh, I'm sorry. I guess, oh gosh, I have to restart this. Let me see how to do this. I thought if I kept clicking, it might restart. No, I know. But where's the launch pad here? There, there we go. All right, now I'm at the beginning. It's always a very good place to start. Um, keep going. Too fast. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, well, we do our best. I'm sorry, these, I, I'm sorry, these are so blurry, the, the blow-ups, but I didn't have access to the large scans um, in time to do them from the larger scans. I wasn't able to do that. I have a feeling I've gone too far now. Have I? Yes, I have. Have I gone too far? Okay, sorry. No, you're right, you're right. Okay, the calendar. And turning and the binding. And there yeah, is. there he is, Bishop Saint painted him. Um, uh, well, it's, he's actually <laughs> like a real human being. He's actually quite large. I mean, it's quite tall. In it, this, I, I propped it to fit it here because I wanted 
you'd be able to see all of the images of Khan currently. Um, the style is one that I'm not an expert in Italian manuscript painting, so I'm uh, floundering here a little. But I certainly know that I've seen things like this from Provence and from Italy. Um, I think there are others who might be, J.J.G. Uh, Alexander, where are you, um, who really would be able to probably come up with it in a minute. But I do know it's certainly not Northern European, and that's clear also from the border foliage. Um, that's a whole other line of you know, investigation. Um, and that it, I, think, I think the artist could be identified. That there's a great deal of documentation on um, Italian manuscript illumination, both by Italian and um, scholars elsewhere in Europe and North America. J.J.G. J. Alexander would be the, the best of them here in the U.S. Um, in your I don't think it would have bothered any owner in, in a way. It's simply, it's an embellishment. Plus it's, you know, it's a bishop saint and it's right. It, in fact, you can also see it really as a way of introducing the calendar. You turn the, this is a recto, you turn to the verso and the calendar begins. So maybe they owned the family, whoever owned it, this could have happened at any time in the last five centuries said, well, you know, let, let's, put, let's put our little bishop cut in here because you know, it's a nice way to, we don't have any, the calendar of course has no pictures. It's just text. So having a picture there is kind of a, in effect, as many as miniatures are meant to do, they're meant to mark the beginning of a text. And this is, I think, sort of a um, catch as catch can way to do that when the original book is relatively modest in terms of miniature numbers. Yes. Um, the earliest printed books of Ellis, did they also have illustrations? And if so, how were they done? They, not so much in the beginning memory serves, working my gray matter here. The earliest one is about 1477 or 79, and I don't think it has images. It's when the Parisian uh, printers began really producing books of hours. And let me be clear that the Parisians produced uh, printed books of hours, not just for Paris use, for all over France, the, the Southern Netherlands. Um, and this, I should add also that Italian printers often provided printed um, manuscripts. There's a breviary for the very rare use of the um, collegiate church in Antwerp that was printed in Venice. No pictures. But for the, you know, for the popular, for the public, one of the great things about a printed, back to that, that takes us right to the beginning, right past it, there, is how easy it is to put woodcuts in. Once you've set, you can then produce, you don't, and then the luxury books, often they had them painted in. They had the woodcuts painted in. It meant that you had the wealth of imagery absolutely explodes once you get to printed books. And it was the Parisian printers of the late 15th century that recognized this didn't add a great deal to their costs or their efforts. And they would, of course, reuse the um, borders here for books of hours for every possible use um, all over France and elsewhere. So um, I think that's, that was, of course, another attraction, especially printed on paper. These were relatively affordable. and they had pictures often on every, in every margin on every single page, doing that by hand, you know, illuminating it by hand. That's beyond the range of, of, of anyone, you know, who, other than someone who's exceptionally wealthy or a member of the nobility. Yes. Can I ask you just to walk me through again what you think happened with those upper border um, lines in 1460? The, the two miniatures that have the, the decorated upper borders. Sure. I think they don't want to get the past the sense. Here we go. Okay. Um, maybe I can do it best easily here. Um, for example, here, look at these lines, the way they go beyond. That's that, of course. The way they go beyond there. Here, look at the way that these um, leaves are cropped, you know, crimped or uh, covered over by these added uh, baguettes. Something that I realized looking at the man, I wrote this uh, presentation without seeing the actual book. Um, if you go to the opening of the penitential Psalms, which I don't have in a detail, they actually overlap the text. The arguas me, the R of A-R-G-U-A-S, it's broken at A-R and G-U-A-S. They totally overlap the R. And it's, to do it, they had to paint almost into, right into the gutter. And so you're, the, 
manuscript as shown online, when they photographed it, they could only press it so flat in order to, and I wasn't sure whether it was there or you know, whether I was misreading it, but I looked at the manuscript and it's really crimped. And so if you go throughout, you can see, and also this, the idea of putting a baguette outside like this and cramping it right into the gutter, you know, or, you know, just right in there. This, uh, these overlaps, these uh, crops, these crimps suggest an addition. It also makes the book, look, it makes the book, frankly, look rather garish. Now, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it does. Now, if you go to the manuscript and open it to the open page of the litany, and we can do that, we all can do that later, you will see that this was a page that is the only one in the book that had not um, on a page with a large initial like these, these big colored initials. It's the only one that has a partial border, panels on top and bottom with the joining baguette. And whoever added these decided that they couldn't, that the baguettes made no sense there. It's the one page that shows you what it must have originally have looked like. Again, which I finally caught while working on the manuscript last night. So there are a large number of reasons to think. Um, I mean, the minute I saw this, I thought, well, this is, when in fact, when you were asked me to do this uh, talk and you sent me the links, and I began looking at this, I thought, good God, I've never seen anything like that. So, you know, I thought, what the, and so I, looking more closely, I think you can see the way things are cropped. And this gives the page a very crowded look. If you look at the page at the beginning of the litany, you can, you'll see how originally, frankly, deliciously preserved and, 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 and also not austere, but not garish and not barren, just right. Just like, you know, Goldilocks porridge. So, and we can actually take a look at that. Yes, Tom. Did you go on in the 13th century? Um, the, the, I suspect they do because they, they're, they're, the style is right. You know, on the other hand, it could also, I mean, you know, in the 19th century, how good people were at, you know, at, you know, basically imitating the style of, you know, medieval manuscripts. Uh, and I do not consider it, I consider it, this is why I think one way to do this is to do a science, scientifically to look at the pigments and see, are they, Late medieval pigments are the binding of the binders. Late medieval, and that I think would be the, the best way to be sure what's the, when they might have been added. I think for anyone who you know, uh, for a seller of the book, whenever having those borders makes it you know it's easier to imagine it being a selling point if it's so much more lavish. Maybe you know a client wouldn't have wanted something as well. When we look at the the litany page, um, you see that it's it was it was a relatively Restrained declaration. This, and especially when you get to the um, texts that I mentioned that have to do with the hours of the Virgin from Advent to the purification, they're really, it's just um, head bending. It's, it's so wrong, it's so over the top for a text page in a book where on most pages what you have is if it's a one line initial or two line initial in gold, all you have is a very tiny rinse of spray. And then you've got this. Um, kaboom, sweetheart, kind of look. Yes? Are there, uh, is there any evidence about their overprinting to some of the other images or any changes that have been made to the other pages? Let me be, <laughs> let me be delicate here. This is where a scientific analysis might be very, very useful. And I have like to stop myself. Yes? Yes. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yeah, it's it's certainly common in two and ankles. It's very often. Um, I've, I've worked on. Well, I've been, my get privileges master mentioned that book I wrote. The artist um, worked for two and eight patrons, and this was a very common thing. Um, you can even have a book of hours entirely in French. This is unusual in manuscript. Very unusual. But yeah, it's not uncommon to have the root in French, uh, presumably because the owner, well, we know it was made in Tournay and for someone who followed the, the use of Tournay. So they would have been frank upon, you know, I don't think it, only a small part of the diocese of Tournay, um, you know, well, actually I correct myself, the southern part of the diocese of Tournay totally falls into the Francophone, the Francophone Belgium. The actual language line, let me correct myself, is about nine kilometers north of uh, Tournay. And when you cross it, you know, even now. Uh, yes? I'm very interested by your idea of the 
I started that work um, this afternoon. I, as you know, we had a wonderful lunch and it went on. Yeah, you know, it, it was, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go back to it tomorrow. So I'm trying to call it. I'm trying to call it. And because the inserted leaves make for a hellish task of you know, calling a manuscript like these. Often when I encounter a book, I know the miniatures are inserted. I just say, did not call it all one more, all full page miniatures inserted unless I have the time, and I'm going to try to do this. Um, but the way they're tipped in, they're mostly glued. I'm not seeing any stubs. I'm seeing mostly glue. And um, the book is tightly bound, but it's tighter than I'd like. And so there's a point at which you, you don't want to hear the popping sound. I think one of them would be bound. Um, I contacted a specialist Well, th this one the, sure was. This one, one the spine. The signature of the binder. Would uh, well, it was the, the spine is rebacked. There's yeah. no question yeah. about it. It's the part that would have worn out first. The other binding is late 15th or early 16th century, and I haven't really looked long enough at the spine to see if it was um, restored. Yeah. But often they had to be. Um, the marvel of this book is how exquisitely regular it is. It's all gatherings of eight with uh, with catchwords. It's marvelous. It. You know, I spent an hour and a half with it, and I thought this this is cake. This is just pure pleasure. You know, you, you don't have to pull and find the cords in the middle of the four bifolia. Um, there was a horrible incident at the British Library. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a manuscript that Dr. Prim published. And I heard the sound. <laughs> so I walked it up to the, to the um, person and said, I'm afraid I, I may have pulled too good a part of calling into some very sorry thing. I said, it's okay, we'll put it on the list. So I kept my reader's card. Don't say anything. <laughs> yes? I think it's got, going back to the English of the pages in French, and then the next line, but it, once you get into sort of French books that I was in the early 19th century, is there a, is there a corresponding shift towards this more sort of production in the vernacular in general? Or do you still also get a lot of... I, 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 I can't really answer because I'm not that uh, strong and specialist in, in the printed books of ours. Um, I mostly when I look at them, I'm looking to confirm what kind of, what a book was, when I'm looking to, for example, get a full office of the dead. And I know the book states this hours for the use of law. This I say the book of hours for the use of Soissons. And I'll talk about that at the workshop tomorrow that, um, that I'm following my own Dr. Father John Plummer system. I don't just confine myself to versicles. I go for lessons, versicles, responses, because you can't get individual pieces unless you go for the whole, basically you have, you know, nine lessons, you have a lesson, versicle, response, and if you go the whole hog, which is 27 readings, you can, uh, you can get very, very precise, but you have to either use a confirmed manuscript one where it's the rubric states, it is for the use of shallows and not for, or better is the printed ones, because of course these were vetted to make sure that they would work in the diocese they would be marketed in. If they had to go in and, and pen write in corrections, this is not a sellable book. You know? And in the end, we are dealing with objects of commerce. Yeah, two other questions. <laughs> so one, Roll them. one is about the margin uh, on the page of the Annunciation. If looking at the- This one, the one on the screen now. No. The, the, the other the hours. Four page miniature with the, with the Annunciation. Okay. Uh, in this book. In the other one. I'm on my way. Yeah, there I go. Well, no, this, okay. This, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think about frames? Do, they do you mean the baguettes or do you mean the. The colors? Um, you're talking about the miniature or the borders? The borders. How do you mean? Do, do I think that this style is strange? They look strange to me. I don't know if it's the quality of... Are you talking about... Either. Do you mean the fact that it's mostly a canvas and almost no um, little gold designs with lines? Do you mean that... I mean, the fact that they match... Um, I don't know. I have the doubt that they were original. And I well, wonder if, the, okay. if you are familiar with these kind of colors. You mean the reds, the blues, the, the greens? Leaves. Oh, the, the canvas. Right, the green. And... Oh, sure. Um, 
look so at bright. yes, and indeed in two hundred manuscripts, look at some of the color pages in my book made in Flanders on again privileges. There's nothing. These in, these are not surprising coloristic at all. Next question. Uh, the other question you you mentioned that you think uh, they are commercial books, and I I don't know if you have a chance to kind of look at that deeply. And I wonder if there are any female traits or something kind of that maybe I wonder if they were made for women, and I wonder if in the text that there are any. Well, the usual, uh, do you, okay, made for a woman or written by a woman? No, made for a woman. Okay, the usual way to do that is to find the prayer, of course, that um, would identify, you know, would identify, you know, the gender identify. The normal place is the obsequote or the ode temerata. That's the easy way. Um, and there, there are sometimes you will get another prayer in the suffrages where you have the good fortune that it was written, given a custom writing, and so they, you know, and they will say, you know, um, Ziliatrix or whatever, or one of those things. Um, both of these books lack the obsequiteano and temerata, this, which is a source of grace and frustration for me because often variant readings, and I'll talk about this tomorrow at the workshop, can be very helpful in uh, localizing uh, books of ours because it's a standard text for which there is no standard text. And the variants can be dramatic and often they identify where the book was written for. And that's where you go usually to identify if it's made for a woman. That said, often the masculine ones, in fact, are, um, you know, for, um, made for, in fact, um, a woman. I've also known, I've seen also books where one text is written for a woman, the other for a man. I've also seen ones um, written for a woman where the patron is, and arms are illustrated, and it's a man. Of course, this isn't strange. I mean, if it was made for a married couple, you know, it's not as if the book was utterly exclusive to the one party. So this becomes, you know, kind of um, tricky. I've long wanted actually to use my website, my database, to see if I can prove, okay, um, how many books of ours are written for women and are, how many of them actually are, were owned by men, if you can demonstrate for men, okay, made for men. Um, this is not a task I've tackled um, yet, part because I'm not satisfied with the um, search engine in my database, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. If they had the obsequiary, I would have told you, trust me. Trust me, you have my word. Uh, other questions? Do you have another one? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking about the calendar that you pointed to again, and the, the rest of the manuscript you said that seemed to be made in Russia because of mm -hmm. the sexist contrariness. And I was wondering if you notice any difference, uh, if you think the scribe who worked on the calendar was different from the scribe who wrote the calendar. Um, that's certainly not true for the hours now on the screen. They are very consistent. It's a very beautiful, very beautiful Gothic book. Um, with the other one, I, I think they could be different because the, the calendar uh, writer has a very um, ver vertical ductus. Whereas the text is, well, it's very slanted. It, it's, the ductus to, is, is rightward. And those could have been made in, by two different um, scribes. But, uh, you know, then again, that could mean that the calendar was really written for Ghent because the saints indicate that, the red letter ones. Note that the problem with that manuscript is also that the calendar is extremely thin. You know, you only have two red letter saints. There isn't a black letter saint that is exclusive to Bruges as opposed to Ghent as opposed to Tournay as opposed deal. Um, and so um, I think that the body of the manuscript, though, you know, putting Babel among the martyrs is a really faux pas. Um, and that I think, that part, I, I think it just simply makes more sense. It was written uh, in Bruges where they might be able to make that kind of mistake. I mean, the two anchor institutions of Ghent are the, you know, abbeys of St. Babel mm -hmm. and the abbey of St. Peter. I mean, how do you, and everyone knows that Babel was not a martyr. He was a confessor. He confessed the faith. He didn't die for it. So that would be my thinking there. Question? I see a hand. I also noticed that the sixth month was written differently in the calendar or in the entry. So Saint Amand. Yes. See at the end uh, in the calendar and was among this CES. Well, that's that's not. A, I don't think that's a common 
Not, that's, I think it's a very, that's, that's not an objection, sure. But the same type of what's right is different between the calendar and the calendar? You're saying that it's D in the calendar and... No, well, it's, but it's on the day for M A M A D N A M A N D S. See, that's the thing in the calendar, since it's on the right day for Amandus, who is you know, a broadly worshipped Southern Netherlands saint. There, you, you you have you have no problem. If it's in the litany, then of course it gets tricky because how many Amandus, or is there also is an Amant? I can't believe it's the old. But you know, given the context where the book was made and where you have Babo in there, you're talking about a Southern Netherlandish. I think that's maybe just a slip of a letter. Um, again, this is of course just off the top of my head. I hadn't, I hadn't gone that deep in. I mean, well, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I have another least about this, and I am sure my question about how you could be commercial, how it would value in the sense that the scribes were the artists to the relations weren't always unique. Like what were you paying for when you would commission a book like this? If, if not the artist, if not, if, you know, if they're overpaying it later on, if you can increase the sales value, I mean, I don't understand how they would do that. Does that make sense? Valued in terms of what you pay. Like in the sense, if I were to commission one of these books, no, obviously not now, but what, what am I paying for when I'm commissioning this? Well, you would go to the um, big rare, that is the bookseller that would um, basically be the entrepreneur and you would say okay I want a book of hours I've got this budget um, I you know I need to have I'd like to have these texts I'd like to have these images um, what you know what oh, can I get and they would have had of course, sample books you know it would be I don't want to say it's like going to the um, wallpaper place and being shown samples but you were you know that kind of maybe was you were basically you know saw what you would get. If you look at the Dougal accounts, that is the accounts of the Dukes of Burgundy, and of course in this era, we're in the era of the Burgundian Empire. Dougal accounts lay it out right down to the smallest amounts of money, who's, how much, how many initials, and what are they worth, and what are we paying for them? Because these, these, of course, this is how the Dougal accounts, they had to keep track of where the money went. And these are written right down to every, you know, every single decorative element often developed. Because you're paying, you're paying for vellum, which of course is not a cheap material, if it's a manuscript with, um, with opaque paint. Because the thing with paper is that you can paint opaquely, but it shows right through and often there's too much bleeding to the other side, which you often see in German manuscripts written on paper where there's a lot of bleed through the paper. Um, then you're paying, of course, for how many lines of text? Um, what, how are one line initials decorated? Do you get gold? Get gold leaf. Do you get a simple filigree that is an elegant sort of um, pen, pen filigree design? How many of them are there? How many pictures do you have? Um, did you get did you get it from a really first rate artist, or did you, you know, go down the road to the um, you know, say Walmart, but to someone a bit more affordable, you know, whose price isn't as high because maybe the, it isn't as refined. Um, I think in the main the main thing, I mean, we, we, we I think we have to realize these really were used. For, um, I mean, luxury ones often um, were not. They're simply prestige objects. You sometimes wonder, given how clean they are, whether they were ever even um, uh, looked at. Uh, when I wrote about the Isabel La Catolica hours, and I read how during the marriage of one king of Spain to some donor, something, um, the king demanded that the uh, Isabel hours, which was in, is in the royal collection, uh, be given to her. Um, to occupy the more prolix stretches of her very long wedding to the king. And it was on her Phrygia and she was just flipping through it. Um, and I'm just imagining her, you know. Are you gonna challenge, are you gonna challenge the future queen of Spain? The, the, the curator of masters is probably just sweating bullets, but you don't argue it. Like buying a car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the leather interior. What's it going to take to put you some gold Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I think you should. You know, on top of the line, the, the steering wheel heats by itself. The seats heat by themselves. You click a button on your fob, and they know you're coming in five minutes. The heat. The car is preheated, turned on, 
and all the rest of it. I'm, I'm terrified by the damn thing that speaks at me. You're getting too close. <laughs> so before we look at the manuscript, so I want to say a couple of quick words. Um, part of which my management, fly by the seat of my pants management style. This came together rather quickly, and I want to thank Deborah Bella for doing such a good job at doing it all together. Um, and second of all, on, on the same note, I would really want to invite a very good this whole thing for a lecture on the book, book of hours as a concept, some prominent examples. I'm just uh, honored and amazed that he actually wrote this talk for us, for our books of hours, um, especially for this occasion. And without very much time, again, thanks to my management staff. This. Oh, um, yeah, I think I think two weeks before today I did say something like I think we I need to know that we want. <laughs> so, um, let's let's double your time. Thanks very much.